What's up everybody, it's Dylan here with D Woo Does Things. Thanks for tuning back into my channel. This is the inaugural episode of D Woo Goes Deep, where I talk with movers and shakers within the outdoor industry and try to document some of the history within the outdoor space. And today I'm speaking with Rich Page, founder of Savage Mountain Gear in North Conway, New Hampshire. Rich is the creator of the famous Jackpot 40 Alpine Pack. He is working with mountain equipment and forecast tools to bring some more amazing outdoor climbing gear to the space here in New Hampshire. And I'm really, really excited. So this is a fun conversation. Uh, we talk a lot about Alaska and um, Colorado and, and just a lot of the history within the outdoor space all the way from New Hampshire out to Alaska. So stay tuned. It's a, it's a fun talk and, and I'm excited to bring it to you all and, and help document some of what this man has created and, and how he's helped move the climbing industry forward. Rich currently owns and operates Savage Mountain Gear, which builds alpine packs and equipment for mountaineering and alpine climbing. He also operates the gear dock right out of the same shop where he provides repair services for outdoor garments and equipment and pretty much any type of equipment you might have. When I was in the shop, uh, somebody brought in their, their leather carpentry tool belt and he, he works on a whole myriad of, of, of gear and equipment, but primarily outdoor gear. So if you need new zippers, patchwork done, gaiters on your mountaineering boots, Rich can do that. He spent a long time as a cobbler building leather climbing shoes and things like that way back in the day. So really excited to, to highlight what this man has done and to tell his story. So stay tuned. Let's get into it. Sweet. All right. So I think we're, I think we're live. Yeah. Should have brought some coffee. <laughs> yeah. Beer soon. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh... The beer pack. Did you see that video? No. So Cam, um, friend from Colorado, took uh, one of the new bullseyes, the 40, filled it with ice and filled it with beer, <laughs> lugged it to this event in Fort Collins. Oh, nice. <laughs> she opens it, to, you know, just pops it down by a friend and Rodney's opening it up and it's like, <laughs> beer and ice. <laughs> <laughs> and it holds the ice in it. It holds the ice, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. So it's cool. the beer pack. We're going to have it at um, the Crag and Classic that Rumney this weekend. Okay, cool. The beer pack. There you go. Get, get nice. problem, so try to make a make an event out of it. Mm -hmm. How many ice cubes are in the pack? Oh, there you go. <laughs> at, at a certain give, point in time. Because right? they melt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. How many uh, how many liters is that pack? Uh, there's or, two, yeah. two. There's two of the. That's the bullseye. There's two of them. Uh, Twenty five and a forty. Cool. So and that's what these. That's what that green one is up there. Yep. It's the Twenty five. So a day of crag and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. part of the deal is it um, carries like a pack, um, but it hauls like a bag. So it seems like a lot of the haul bags, even the small ones, they're, they're better hauling than they are like carrying your load to the cliff. Totally. You know? And they've yeah. got, it's the, it needs to excel at something. Mm -hmm. So it's going to excel at the haul part. Yep. So. Sweet. Yeah. That's a new product for it just, the, just this summer, the bullseyes. Yeah. Awesome. So. What? Talk to me a little bit about the lead up and and what created Savage. And you know, what took you from a wee lad to where you are now? Mm, okay, so I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, I've been doing this since 1967. I started working in sewing factories in Colorado back in those days. Pretty exciting period. Um, the mid to late 70s, Gore-Tex had just come out, Fleece had just come out, and everybody's trying to figure out how to use this stuff. Huh. And so it was a pretty exciting time. I was 20 years old, pretty exciting time to be in the outdoor business. So that's kind of how we all got the started in this, and that was in Estes Park, Colorado. Um, they ended up moving to Longmont, which is down in the, 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 the flats outside of Boulder. And I didn't move to Colorado to, to live in Longmont. Mm -hmm. So I moved to Colorado to live in Estes Park. So I got a job working uh, at Camino Boots, fixing, fixing boots. Cool. So it was um, the days of leather boots, just a couple of miles of rock shoes. Uh, stuff was resolable in those days. So <clears throat> the first, and from there, we started our first company called Buzzard. And this was in Estes Park, very much like what we're doing now. Uh, small little, you know, one-man band thing. 
and we built packs, we built Gore-Tex, we built rain gear, we built all sorts of stuff, and we sold it out of our store. Sweet. And we also sold climbing gear, which is how I first got hooked up with Wild Country guys. And um, we sold that company in 1988 to Wild Country, uh -huh. and uh, that's kind of how I ended up here. Sweet. So. It's funny, I just bought, I was over at IME a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I, I bought an old wild country, you know, one of the uh, mountaineering tent. It's okay, yeah. Super small blue one. It's yeah. kind of like that, the same kind of fabric that the Bibbler tents the have. The Nexus backing. Text. Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. I'm uh, really stoked to find that. You know, you can't find anything about it on the internet because it's a pre-internet tent, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's like a Bibbler tent, but it has a, a, an awning on the front. Um, it's uh, there's no vestibule. It's just the the two pole two cross pole design, right? Um, and it's got you know the double zipper entrance, and it's it's just super super burly. But it really doesn't small. doesn't have any type of an awning or a roof over the door. This one didn't come with one. Okay. No, now, there was one. Um, I forget the, the name of it, but it was like the I tent, like that tent, but it had this awning over the front so when you unzip the door all the snow didn't fall inside oh okay so i was thinking vestibule yes it does happen that awning all yeah, right yeah. yeah that's a nice tent it's sweet yep cool yep. so i was excited about that i bought it for my my partner she's she's a short one so it's like kind of perfect for her yeah yeah um, yeah yeah but um Oh, cool. That's a great design. Yeah. So, um, what, what brought you out to Estes Park? Climbing and skiing. Yep. Nice. Where, where were your, your main stomping grounds over there? Uh, oh, geez, just the park. Yep. Yeah, I never went, I rarely went climbing in Boulder. I mean, to, a lot of people even back in the 80s in Boulder and compared to what we had up in Estes Park. Um, so that was kind of nice. I mean, just got the whole park. We had Lumpy Ridge. There's just, you know. Perfect time to be there. Yeah, yeah. Bef <laughs> before it was cool, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, so I know you've uh, you've spent quite a bit of time up in Alaska too. Yep. Talk to me about some of those adventures. <laughs> you got any, any any crazy stories? Oh, I mean, yeah, lots of stuff goes on up there. Um, it's just a great place to go and do stuff for climbing and skiing. It has everything. It has everything that I like to do. It has skiing, it has climbing, it has sea kayaking, it has pack rafting now, it has backpacking. They have bears, they have eagles, they have moose, uh, rivers that don't have dams on them. Yeah, yep. I, you uh, know. I think last time I was in, I was talking to you about the Charlie River up there. Okay. Um, it's, it's way, yeah, so we started in Fairbanks. We flew about 100 miles east out into the Yukon, and the Charlie River is about 100 mile river um that flows into the yukon and then we took the yukon back west to a little town called circle okay and then drove uh whatever highway maybe it's the dalton i think so yeah, highway the back to fairbanks yeah the dalton and uh yeah it was just such an amazing remote yeah. trip um you know you're out there and there's there's nothing for for 200 miles basically yeah. the only people we saw were in f-22 fighter jets and we um i was in this inflatable canoe and we were just going down this real bony section. We actually flipped it and everything stayed inside. We had everything tied down, but while we were flipping it, turning it back over, these two F-22s just tear through this, this canyon that we're in like 400 feet above our heads. It was just dis disorienting. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like all you can hear is the river and then all you can hear is nothing. <laughs> like it's just, it, was, it was pretty wild. That was a, kind of a fun experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, Those yeah, guys was, are just out flying around. Hey, let's go see these guys. Give them a show. I mean, yeah, it's a perfect training ground for, you know, there's the military base up there in Fairbanks. And while we were flying over to our, to, to our put-in at this little place, landing strip called Three Fingers, um, you know, you just see all the artillery ranges uh. um, out there and, you know, a couple little roads and things like that that just kind of disappear. And then you look down and you see a dredge that's been there for 100 <laughs> years. Yep. And, um yeah, it's just, it's so vast up yeah. there. And, you know, the cool yeah. thing, too, is a lot of places you go to, you don't need the permits and stuff like that yet. Yep. So, I mean, if you go to Denali, you go to the Ruth, you know, you need permits and stuff like that. And, geez, when we went to Sanford, I don't think we, we didn't register with the Park Service. Mm -hmm. I think so. Denali, Logan, and Foraker, you, mm. you need permits for those. I could be, could be mistaken. Right. But, but the point of the story is, 
lots of places in Alaska, you don't need permits. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it's just such a playground, and every, the scale there is yeah. just unbelievable. We had uh, uh, rented sea kayaks out of Homer and had cut across the bay. I think we had come around, um, I don't recall an island or whatever, but anyways, um, camping on the beach and Mount Redoubts across the bay. Yeah. And there's a little plume of steam coming out. Yeah. And there's a seal swimming around in front of us. And all this is happening. It was a little bit like the Flintstones, you know, with the, <laughs> the, <laughs> with the volcano and stuff. And it's like, wow, this is pretty primitive stuff. But it was pretty cool, too. Yeah, it's, it's, really, it's just threatening you yeah. know, to, <laughs> to go. Do it's something. It's ever-present. And, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, it's an active volcanic zone. Yeah, you know, it's that's cool. That's how that all... You know, it's kind of interesting, and um, of all the things that, cons that that frightened me about climbing in Alaska, I think one of the, <clears throat> the the biggest one that you have no control over is a frickin' earthquake. And if an earthquake happens and you're underneath something, you know. Yep. Yep. So, but you know, I don't I don't recall ever hearing that happening. Mm -hmm. So that's the good news, I guess. But anyways, just that you know, the, always the risk. That ever present. Yep. Right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so. What, were, what have been some of your, your most notable climbs and ascents out there? Um, I mean, they're all pretty cool. I mean, every area is a little bit different. Denali is fun just because it's so big. Um, I mean, that's kind of a cool, cool, cool attraction. Did a lot you take of people. the West Buttress? I've done the West Buttress, yeah. Um, and there's places we climbed a lot on the Ruth Gorge back in the 80s. Yeah, so yeah, cool. that's where like the Moose's Tooth is, Dan Beard. Mm -hmm. Uh, 11300, Huntington, all those are in there. And what's really cool about that is, one, the weather's much better mm -hmm. than on Denali because you're farther away from it. Um, you're lower, base camp's at like 6,000 feet, and the peaks are, you know, 10 to 12. Cool. Yeah. So you really yeah. don't have the altitude issues. It's not as cold mm -hmm. because you're lower. Um, what's neat about the Ruth, Gore, the Ruth Glacier, too, is that it goes out to um, the tundra, so they can come and get you more often, you yeah, know, whereas Denali, you have to go over one shot pass and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, those were some really, um, really great times. I think, you know, that was like 70s and 80s. It was a lot pretty rock and roll and going on. Was Bob Reeve, was Reeve still still flying airplanes at that time? I know he was like quite a bit earlier. Yeah, but. no, I, when I started going to Talkeetna in 1980, uh, we were flying, I was guiding with Fantasy Ridge Alpinism, and uh, we were flying with um, Chuck Keaton Air Taxi, yep. and this is when Doug Geating owned it. Oh, sweet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then Doug sold that, started his own thing called Ge Doug Geating Aviation, and so... Um, he yeah. flew Washburn uh, on a few outings, didn't he? Uh, or am I thinking of something? I think a pretty... I either read it in... Um, well, Iger Dreams. I think I read about him in Iger Dreams. Let's but. see. No, because let's see. Don died in 70. Don Sheldon died in 70. Oh, okay. So Sheldon died in 75. Oh, 80s. Washburn. Maybe. Yeah. I don't remember that at all. I think Brad was pretty much over going to Alaska. Sure. I think he was down at the Grand Canyon in those, those eras. Uh -huh. um, but it was kind of interesting is that, so when I first started going to Talkeetna, we were flying in Cessnas, and that was two people in front, no back seat, duffel bags, fuel, blah, 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 just crammed in the back. Uh, but we were flying in Cessnas, and now when I look at the pictures, I mean, these planes are like huge and giant, <laughs> so powerful. Yeah. So, I mean, we, I like to stay at the, um, the mountain strip, the mountain house uh, airstrip there in the Ruth Gorge across from Dan Beard. And <clears throat> people weren't landing down on the Great Gorge a lot in those days. Uh, they do now, and I think the big thing is the planes are so powerful now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, when you land on the glacier, you land under full power going uphill, right. spin the plane around, and take off going downhill, so. And so, yeah, it's just a lot of change is going, um, going on. Yeah, you know, yeah, it just, up there. it just keeps advancing and developing, and you know, we keep working in efficiencies, and it's, how would you say, what, from the time, from the days that you first started climbing in Alaska to today, what would you say have been the biggest changes that have pushed this lifestyle forward? You know, either technologically or, or um, ideologically. Let's see. So, I, I, if I read the question, 
to me, so um, some big advances for me that I've seen in Alaska climbing, having done it for 40 or some odd years now, is when people, when we stopped sleeping at night, when, when the kids started saying, dude, it never gets dark. Why are we stopping? I don't know, we just because we did. We read it in the magazines. You stopped at five o'clock, you set the bivy and you brewed tea, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that I think was just one of the like lightning bolt things. It's like, of course, Yeah. you know? Yeah. That's cool. And, and that's how they get that, that single push Slovak direct. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so I think that was one of the, like, one of the things that just like, holy smokes. I mean, never dawned on us just <laughs> to keep going on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yep. Yep. So I think that was one of the things. I mean, gear's certainly done, you know, well, well too, but to me, that was just like one of the crazy things. Yeah, so. and, and it kind of, it, it encourages that less is more philosophy of, yeah. okay, we're, you know, you don't need to bring bivy gear for this trip, you know, or, or maybe only bring half of what exactly. you would bring on expedition yep. style. Um, you know, one, you know, one between two people, you just, cram in there like a like a burrito and, or uh, Ameri you know. americans don't do that yeah <laughs> um, like russian style three guys right. two sleeping bags yeah. <laughs> americans don't do that yeah yeah one tent three guys two bags <laughs> but yeah all that type of thinking no the russians are really smart on that stuff yeah or, yeah. or just really really spartan about it <laughs> i mean you got these big puffy suits on anyways and it's not like you're having a party i mean yeah. you're just like gonna oh. get there like you know, you're not going to sleep, mm -hmm. so hopefully mm -hmm. you'll like rustle a little bit and leave at midnight and go to the top and get the hell out of there the next day. Totally. So I, I think it's really cool, really cool thinking. So, <laughs> what would you say to back in the '80s was the most important piece of gear, and what would you say today would be the most important piece of gear for a trip um, like that? Yeah, I think probably the, the the I mean the the big thing with Alaska is just having shelter that's going to you know, take up, it's going to take, take the storm. Mm -hmm. So I think, and that's still kind of the thing. I mean, having, you know, a shelter, we lost a tent on the West rib in 81. We cut it with a shovel at 16 and we ended up in a snow cave and it was the, that was great. Cause the storm, we, it was great. We should have been in a snow cave, you know, cause yeah. you're out every hour, every half hour shoveling this tent out. Just a matter of time before somebody whacks it with a shovel. Yep. Yep. So. Or you know, steps on it with a crampon, or you know, yeah. anything. And yeah. I read it the other day, um, tents are too heavy. A shovel is enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because I think back of those days that we had one foldable shovel with us mm -hmm. between two of us. Was it the old army e tool? No, it was a Salewa brand thing. It folded over. It was metal. Mm -hmm. We didn't use the plastic ones. We knew better than, than to do that. But I just think about that stuff. It's like we had one shovel. Why not bring two? So when we were on Sanford a few years ago, there was four of us. And I think we only brought two shovels. And as I was thinking about it, it's like, you know what? Everybody brings a shovel because everybody can be working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so two of us were like digging and two people were like hanging out. <laughs> that, that is funny. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that you have to learn the why instead of just you know, reading a packing list, yeah. you know, why bring two shovels or why bring three shovels? You know, two shovels is more weight. Oh, but actually it's, it's lighter because the caloric output o over several days of, you know, less people, sh you know, yeah. if you have more people shoveling, shoveling. job gets done you, faster. Even, you know, if it's a long expedition and you're going to have that caloric, intake it matched with food as you know the weight of an extra shovel so like yeah you know um, it's just one of those things that just dawned on me yeah you know yeah. i've been doing this for a while so it's like everybody brings a shovel now <laughs> yep yep cool so awesome yeah so what are you what are you up to these days um talk to me a little bit more about savage what you guys are doing and working on you mentioned the the beer bag yeah um, the beer pack you know. so this summer we got uh some rock packs going uh, one of the things that we ended up with that we weren't fully aware of is we're a seasonal business. Um, so a little, we we're having to hustle a little bit this spring and summer to keep things going. Um, but we also learned that. And so from that, we have two rock packs that we've been getting going this summer. Um, what else, repairs are really busy for us. Um, what else have we been doing? We did, a, we did a gear sling, which Brian has right now. What else have we been doing? Oh, we did these Skittles packs. 
What are those? It's these packs over here, all the all the multicolor ones. Oh yeah, sweet. Yeah, we'll look at some some B-roll footage of that. So yeah. yeah. So kind of getting kind of rounding the line out a little bit, and mostly just getting ready for this winter. Um, looking forward to a big season selling ice packs. Uh, that program's growing all the time. Um, looking to have enough ice crew pouches this year. We kind of got behind on building those last year and we're already addressing this. Uh, we're working with another factory starting, uh, what, I think I go next Tuesday or Thursday, Ragged Mountain Equipment here in town. Yeah. So they're going to be building those for us, so that's kind of cool. And we've got the forecast tools here at, at the shop, so that's really nice. Mm -hmm. um, those guys don't really have much of a retail shop presence, so it's very loose business arrangement. They're friends, we're all friends, and we're kind of just a drop off and a pickup point for those. Cool. Uh, we'll have a demo program going this winter, so people can pick those things up here. Um, yeah, can we can we talk about those a little yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> These are super sweet. One piece of machined aluminum. Yep, 7075. Comes in a big block. They get milled out like this out of yeah. a big block, and it takes three hours. <laughs> so, um, I guess a couple, a couple of the big things about it, they're still, they fit inside the box, so they're legal for um, tournaments and things like that. Big grip for double hands, the extra pinky guy there. You have to tape these things too is kind of the deal. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I and think we're uh, working on the brand. There is a brand that these guys like. Um, and I've talked to them about selling it on their website and also us having it here. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've used a different brand for a while. And one of the things I didn't like about the brand was the Vipers is um, the grips were so small. Mm. And then I was talking with Zach and he goes, well, let's just add tape. Huh, there we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or uh, wrap it with a, with a bicycle tire to... This tape is better. Yeah. Yeah, this yeah, tape is so. like, yeah, that's why we just got to like do this tape. I, it's They're getting back to us right now, but yeah, they, nice. they see it. Cool. Um, what do you think about the titanium head though? You know, it, does it add enough heft and is it, is it burly enough? These aren't or? titanium. These are steel. Oh, okay. It's, so yeah. even, I know it has the, it has the emblems and anything. That's what this guy had did. This is the Kirkinogi guy. Yep. These are... The, these are pre-picks to these. These are what the new picks are looking like. Gotcha. Cool. So uh, the Kirkinogis did have that and it was misleading. Yeah. That's, so that is kind of funny. It's, um, yeah. It didn't feel or look like titanium, yeah, no, but it, yeah, it just threw me off a little bit. So yeah. No, the picks are beautiful. Yeah. I mean, one of the things too, I was listening to Zach the other day, aggressive. is that this um, arc here <clears throat> is almost level. It's uh -huh. almost a straight line. Yeah. Whereas a lot of the other people have more of an arc uh -huh. and I guess that makes it hard to remove huh. you know I've never really thought about it yeah. so I was listening to the sales pitch the other day <coughs> pardon me but I think yeah they're kind of kind of the deal nice people are liking them they're digging them they're yep. expensive give you um, enough swing yeah the reach is great even cool. for little people yeah yeah. Um, some of the girls around here are, are climbing in them and they're like, you know, five foot tall and they're not getting overpowered by them. Yep. Yep. So, so just, just the perfect mixed climbing yep. machine here. Yeah. Nice. So, what are these, uh, what are these retailing for? It's eight seventy five for a set. Yeah. Yep. So. Oh, they're, they're, they're freaking pretty. <laughs> um, you know. These guys are working on some other stuff too. Uh, some less expensive tools. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So yep. same level of technicality. Yeah, just to, yeah. It's a, just it's a, more accessible. it's a better, it's a different blank. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll let Brian talk to you about that. Nice. Not sure Fully removable is. hardware, interchangeable. Yeah, same thing. Ads and hammer. Is there an ads with these two? Nope. Just hammer. Yep. Yep. Cool. And that doesn't really work, but it is a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you need to bang something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, who's placed? How many plate don't? place pins but what I've always liked about hammers is like I, I can bang on stuff I can bang on sheets of ice mm -hmm. I can bang on flakes I can bang on stuff yep. just to see what it sounds like yep yep so, sweet comes with nice. I guess this point's clippable you can clip from that which mm -hmm. I guess uh, some of the other models don't and because it's one piece um, you're not getting the old death wobble from the inserts when the glues you know yeah go out so I mean all that's a little bit more expensive yep yep so for sure I mean tolerances and it's got to be pretty dialed. Mm. 
Neat. So yeah, we're kind of helping these guys out, getting these things going. Also brings people into our shop, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. You want to talk about your packs a little more? Sure. Cool. I, I knew about your Jackpot 40 before anything else. All right. Yes, yeah, so let's look at this yeah, guy. Let's keep that on there for the... Okay. Yeah, let's, uh, let's keep it fully rigged up. So this is actually one of our demos. We've got most of our packs are down at the Craig and Classic in Rumney right now, waiting to go off for that next uh, weekend. All right, so the uh, Jackpot 40 is kind of a... I don't know, it's a pack that's been in evolution for a long time, about 40 years. When we decided to do this pack, we'd been, this pack's been morphed from originally called the Andromeda at Buzzard Days. I forgot what it was called at Wild Country, did two rounds there, but it's a well used pack. And so, I don't know, kind of got into this Vegas gambling thing, jackpot. Everybody wants to win the jackpot, so the <laughs> deal. One of the big things that happened with this pack <clears throat> and why it took a while for us to get it out is. <clears throat> when we design something, I, I want to I be able to say something that's different. Mm -hmm. I don't want to emulate other stuff. And up until we started doing this pivot lock, people were doing the band with more and more webbing and buckles and bungees and crap like that, which just doesn't work. And one of the things we realized a long time ago with these new tools is that you can, as long as they have this point pinned, they can't fall out of anything just just because of the way the picks are yeah and so yeah, yeah, yeah. you know i realized this eight years ago and i showed it to keith seidel captain crab walker he goes huh it's called pivot lock <laughs> thanks asshole <laughs> so, so now we've got this great name but we don't have a product for it to go. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so we had it kind of going and uh we we did the um pivot lock when i worked for another company down in maine is when I first introduced that, it was our idea. Uh, but I was working for them at the, at the time and you hired for product development, so that's what you do, you develop products. Yep. So that was one of the first big things that, that works really cool with this. So show, show me that one more time. I'm just gonna hold this up for the camera here. Okay. So the cool thing about these guys, <clears throat> one, there's nothing that can be lost, so there's no straps. Climbers, anything that you can take off the pack, you're gonna lose, just, it's just it's gonna happen. So the cool thing is, this guy pops in like that, just cinches right here. Used to be called ball and bungee, but I don't know what we're calling it now. And so that's kind of the, that's how fast it is. And you can't lose any of these things. Yep. So that's kind of the whole idea. Uh, and that kind, that sole type of thinking goes into the fixed lid. So the lid's fixed. So it's not adjustable. I'm not convinced to pack this size needs to have an adjustable lid. Um, you know, if this pack's not big enough, maybe you're bringing too much stuff. I, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. You know? yeah. So I'm not going to venture there, but that's kind of the scoop on, um, you know, nothing can get lost on this pack. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of fun. You're not, where's the straps for this, that, or whatever. Yep. And the other thing we did was coming up with some type of a crampon pouch and we went with a zippered pouch, um, looking for something a little bit more dedicated, a little bit more fancy than just bungee straps. Uh, you can lose those types of things. I also think it's important to um, be able to close this. Um, some people make a crampon pouch without a top on it. Um, that's kind of nice, but if you tip over, like you fall into a tree well or something and tip over face first, your crampons can roll out. Um, yeah, I think the Hyperlite, uh, like the prism pack the prism. Has, an, has an open yep. top. top. Yeah, yep. exactly. Yep. Yep. Uh, Black Diamond does one type like that as well. Mm -hmm. not, it's not uncommon. The other thing that's fun about having a zip is like, oh geez, there's that one extra ice screw we forgot to throw in the rack and put it in. Well, guess what? I can drop it in here, they're a hundred bucks, zip it up and I'm not gonna lose it. Yep. So I like that. Holds, holds a Nalgene, um, you know, if you're out, out in the day for things like that. So that was kind of the scoop on that. Lots of little tiny features going on with this pack. When we first did the, the first ad for this, Somebody else was doing it. And uh, he goes, well, tell me, you know, send me the list of the features. <laughs> and so I sent him the features and there were 21 of them. <laughs> and he goes, choose four. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Four? <laughs> but dude. <laughs> so it was kind of, I get the point. But it was just kind of funny. Four? <laughs> yep. So yep. some of the things that do what different, pick? these guys, yeah, come off to the side. This is one of those subtle features that nobody else knows except me. See how these come off to the side? So they, so they, 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 they pull the lid down like this. 
Oh, rather than just straight up and down. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you get a better pull. Awesome. So yeah. just some of the little things that, 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 that we do. Yeah, you know, that, that just the, the angle of the straps and how you position them. The ergonomics. That takes years and years of Thanks. development and experience and knowing exactly, not the what, but the why. Mm. And I think... I feel design... Yeah. Two things I like to say when people go, what do you do? I do product development. Well, what is product development? Uh, to me, product, <clears throat> I do things, I think about things that haven't been thought about before. That's what product development's about. So it's like, like what well, one second this idea doesn't exist, and the next second it does. Yeah. It's there. Yeah. And so, um, I mean, that's kind of one of the fun things I think about you know, doing the product development. Um, but also, I think product development is a—it's—it's—it's—it's it's, it's, it's a language, and not, not all not all product development guys, designers make good mountain guides, nor make good business guides, nor do mountain guides make good gear designers. Okay, because we're focused in on like one aspect, and I think um, and the point of the story is is it's a it's a it's a language. All this stuff that's wrong with all these products is out there for everybody to like try to just try to pull this information out from this product. Guys like us, we think about this all the time, but it's a language, and you need to under, you need to know that language. Yeah, and that's what we developed or learned or whatever you know figured out was this language. And I think a good analogy of that is a balance sheet for a business. Um, a balance sheet to somebody who doesn't know what a balance sheet is, it's just a bunch of numbers. Yep. But a balance sheet to somebody that knows what those numbers are on, that's a really good snapshot of somebody's business. And it's language, knowing the language. And I, th I feel that's what um, product development's about, yeah. is yeah. knowing cause, effect. And you know, after doing this for you know, a long time now, 40 some odd years, 45 years now, my toolbox is pretty big is like what I can choose from to like solve these problems. Yep. So. Awesome. Yeah, anyways, a little spiel there on no, what that's, I think we you know, do. That's something that I am did, never expected to, to talk about huh. necessarily, but just the insight is, is super fascinating. Mm. I've um, started a couple of businesses and wrapped those up and just keep you know, evolving and trying to learn and, you know, coming from somebody who's been doing it for so long. And, mm. um, it's just, it's really, it's really You cool. got to change. You got to like, you know, yeah. you got to morph. You just yeah. do, you got to reinvent yourself. Yeah. So, so, so that's kind of other little things that go on. Yeah. Um, little like little things that nobody else notices. This point here to here, this is actually a curve. I'm going to hold it up. So yeah, this, this seam, this piece, from here to here is not straight. This piece has a curve to it. Yep. And the idea behind that is that it curves the, the pack onto you. So things like that. Other things we do, the top of the pack is bigger than the bottom of the pack. It's called overcut. And what's nice about that is that you can, you can see down inside the pack mm -hmm. because the top's bigger than the bottom. So don't really think a pack like this needs an extension in it for this size. Mm -hmm. So we've got a little bit of a, a storm skirt here. Yep. So I think that's good. And what are you using for a frame sheet? We have a thing called a flex frame, and it's a piece of um, plastic that is a piece of here. foam on both sides. And then we stitch it into the back panel. So you can see right through here, you can see these, these lines go mm -hmm. through this layer of fabric, two layers of foam, the plastic, and another layer of fabric. And what that does, and it also gets pinned at, at the waist belt, the frame does, on the inside, and the other thing we have is we have these overload stabilizers that some of the other guys haven't figured out how to do yet. <clears throat> and then by stitching all this together, it just pulls the load mm -hmm. onto you. Mm -hmm. And it's just a direct load It's transfer. direct transfer, that's exactly, yeah. yeah. Yep. <clears throat> and by stitching across here, this doesn't pull out. Um, if you don't stitch that down, this becomes a big barrel mm -hmm, to mm -hmm, carry. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the scoop on that. So there's those types of things that you know we've learned over the years. Um, some people use the removable foam pad in the back. I don't know. I think that kind of went out in the '80s. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody like nobody bivvies anymore. Remember, we have had lamps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. But we do have a little panel in the back here, a little slot that cool. a piece of foam can go in. The guides like to have an extra foam. Yep. around. I don't give you the foam, uh -huh. but that's kind of the scoop on that. Nice. 
Yeah, you know, I um, I bought like a laptop or something, uh, and or you know, some electronic, and it had a, a piece of foam in it. I just kind of wrapped it in duct tape. I made you know, yeah. just a little foam pad out of it. I don't know. Yeah, case for I used sure. It as a sit pad for backpacking and stuff for a little while, and realized it was kind of heavy, but yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. So we have wand pockets. So mm -hmm. um, wand pockets for wandering around the glaciers and stuff. We don't have glaciers here, mm -hmm. but wands aren't a bad idea because you got to find your way back. Yep. Holds pickets, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. This is for uh, a gear rack, the gear clippers here. Yeah. Hold right up. Yeah. The gear clippers here on the waist belt, gear racks. But some folks like them, some folks don't. Uh, we found another little market for this pack was the Pacific Northwest. Uh, wandering around on glaciers, that's where the pickets came into, the, um, and the wands, and being able to clip stuff on for glacier use. I'm not, you know, we're not clipping ice screws and rack onto this, but mm -hmm. got my Prusiks on there. I've got, you know, my Ascender, my Mini Repel. Yep, yep. So that's kind of the scoop on that. Waist belt's sized. It's removable. Mm -hmm. So that's, oh, that's cool. kind of nice. Nice. Yeah, that's I mean, huge. these guys. Do, you, do, do people use this without the hip belt? Some people do. Um... What I've seen people do is just roll it around and back. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know. Yeah, I know Peter Slattery's been been using it for a while. Do you, uh, do you know how he likes to carry it, or does he use a hip belt? Or I can't I have to look at that picture. I can't remember. Yeah. I just, for me, ice climbing. I want this pack attached to me. Yeah, yeah. You know, if I'm coming up over a bulge and I'm on one little point, the last thing I want is my pack to shift sure. and me shift. Mm -hmm. And that's what goes through my head on that. But <laughs> a lot of good climbers doesn't bother them at all so yeah yeah uh, so i don't really think um i mean one of the things we did do is on the waist belt we put everything off to the side oh that's an interesting clip system there yeah, yeah. okay yeah, so yeah it's yeah. off to the side yep. yeah so you, it's not fucking around with your it's your, not right in the middle belay loop and right yeah. where you're tied in yeah mm -hmm. that's a cool buckle so this this hip belt I, I mean it is padded but is this more for stabilization as opposed to load transfer yeah yeah exactly yep. i think on um you know, packs this size, you're not getting a lot of load transfer on the hip belts. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of it's still on our shoulders. It's mm -hmm. kind of the scoop. Yep. So. And what torso sizes do you make this for? Small through large. Yep. So one of the other things that goes on, we have this thing called the stowaway lid. So for people that want to go lidless, brainless, we've got this little port that this goes through here. This gets jammed down in there so you can still have access to your phone yeah. and your sandwich. Let's turn that around so people can see. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is actually a pretty cool feature. So, little port that it goes through. This is the, um, the top compressor on the inside. I saw it, and at first I was like, hydration reservoir? Yeah. It's a climbing pack, what? <laughs> <clears throat> you could, but yeah, it's a port. Um, rescue guys have radios. So, yep. And so that goes like this, so you can go brainless, and that clips in like that. It also, um, Keeps the lid from hitting the bottom of your helmet, so you can look up to see what's going to hit you. Yeah, that's brilliant. So, nice. I think those are kind of the big features. We, I think those are some of the four that I got to choose: mm -hmm. uh, pivot lock, crampon pouch, stowaway lid. Uh, I like names for stuff. This thing's called the um, bull. What do we call this? Bullhorn. Yeah. Weighs belt because of the way it's because of the way it's built. Cool. And do you make all of these to order? Nope. We're a stock program. Nice. We, we don't do much custom work. Mm -hmm. uh, other guys around do that type of stuff. Our goal is to build a line and always have it in stock. Sweet. So nice. that's kind of what, that's, that's, where, that's where we're at. Yep. I mean, yep. originally the goal here was to provide, provide a job for myself, which is the original goal. And so that's why we were building all of the products ourselves. Yep. And over the last six years, we've slowly farmed some of the some of the products out cool. with the goal still being to provide a job for myself. Awesome. So, so you know, here in the, you know, the presidential range area, you know, North Conway, Jackson, um, there's quite a few guys in your, in your, uh, yeah, yeah, community yeah. here. You know, yeah. Randy over at cold, cold world. Randy, we've got, um, John Campbell, Alpine Luddites in Vermont. Yep, yep. He's um, up by Lake Willoughby. Yep. Yeah, he's got a cool program, pack building and all that. Yep. Yeah, he and Randy and um, Randy does custom work. A lot of his stuff does is custom, um, and 
uh, John does knockoffs and you know custom stuff and that type of stuff too. Yep. So yeah, it is kind of interesting. But what's really fun is that we're all a little bit different. Um, I, I visit the. I've known Randy and Ruth Ann for since 1990. We yep. all we all worked together at Wild Country when uh, when we first moved here. So cool. Yeah. Fun little area. Nice. Yeah. Um, you know that's kind of one of the reasons why I wanted to come in and sit down today is to kind of document this as almost as a, as a piece of New Hampshire climbing and outdoor history, really. Um, lot, you know, there's been a lot coming, a lot going on here in the Valley, uh, starting, geez, with Chuck Rose, probably back in the olden days. You ever heard of that name? No. no yeah, you guys haven't. They built mostly fleece type stuff, um, but they employed a lot of people here in the valley. Mm -hmm. um, and then over at Ragged Mountain too, there's, you know, Quartz doing some cool right? stuff. Those guys are kind of like second or third wave. Yeah. There was a company called Log House Designs out of um, Freiburg, Chatham. Yeah. And they did, they have, um, did early Gore-Tex type stuff. Their, the market changed from fairly simple potato sack type of designs, which is what they were producing to the more modern designs of the 90s, and they didn't make that leap. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the catch on that. So mm -hmm. those guys kind of went out too. But yeah, from there, there was Ragged, and they're still going. Um, How about Wild Things? So Wild Things was sold years ago. Yeah. Ketoon sold that. Uh, as I understand, and I, this may or may not be the real, the real story, um, but what I understood was that when she sold the company, the deal was to, to keep this place going in North Conway mm -hmm. as a climbing retail stop shop. Yep. And that went on for a little while, and then the Army guys go, screw it, we make a lot more money selling packs to Joe than you, yep. so. Yep. Anyways, that's the story I heard mm -hmm. of what happened to it. Sure, yeah, so. I know they're making some, you know, some of the Equix, you know, level set, you know, yep. um, big synthetic parkas and puppies and things like that yep. but they made some sweet packs back in the day yeah 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 um, Bergen yeah. outdoor has i think uh migrated into their old space in gorham yeah uh they're over in lincoln uh or maybe the shops in, in the fab shops in gorham I, I think so yeah i mean i drive by that place the wild things banners are still up yeah that's cool a little, little <laughs> homage yeah that's kind of funny yeah, yeah um sweet so you're you're carrying mountain equipment now yeah um, we started doing that in the spring so mountain equipment's been around since 1961, so it makes it longer than North Face and Patagonia. And these guys, uh, they're from Britain, and these guys were the big puffy suits that all the Brits wore on the, the Everest trips, uh, early Himalayan trips in the 70s. These guys were, uh, mountain equipment was one of the big sponsors for that. Big puffy suits of Doug, um, Doug Scott, Dougal Hassett on top of Everett's, that's these guys' suits. Yep, yep. And so, and what they've slowly done is they've tried to uh, get into this like spring, summer shorts type market. And, and that's a tough market. There's a lot of, a lot of competition in that. It's a so, crowded space for sure. Yeah, that, um, that, that one is. Yep, you know, I think, you know, mountain equipment is, you know, for, for folks who are familiar with mountain hardware, I kind of see them in, in a very mm. similar space. I think mountain equipment makes them a little some more specialized, a little higher quality it is, stuff. But, yeah. um, so it's been positioned. You know. um, so the guy that's, it's an interesting story um, in itself of how we ended up with this. So I've worked with this guy, Bill Supple, for a long, long time. And did we talk about this earlier? No, um, I don't think so. Anyways. Maybe. I'm going to turn this light on. Um, I worked with Bill at Wild Country and shared an office with him and worked really well with this guy. And Bill went on, Wild Country was sold, we all lost our jobs. Bill ended up at um, Climb High, which ended up being Mammut. And Bill, yeah. uh, Bill built that brand. Cool. And then after they built the brand, they all got fired. <laughs> and um, few years ago, three years ago, the guys from Britain got a hold of Bill to see if he wanted to build this mountain equipment line. And hadn't seen Bill for a number of years, ran into each other at Ice Fest, which is kind of when this whole thing happened. And, you know, not that we're looking for more to do, but two things that really sold me on getting involved with this brand. Um, I mean, we're all, we're all, 
we're all pretty old. We're not looking to get more stuff going on, but every <laughs> once in a while you got to. Sometimes it's fun. Yeah, two new, things. New One, the opportunity to build a brand. Uh, I want to be a part of that. And I think this brand's going to do that. And so the opportunity to do that. And also the ability to work with Bill Supple again. I mean, it's, those are the two things that really, that I wanted out of this deal. Super and cool. So, yeah, nice. so pretty, feel pretty lucky. All right, well, my camera died. Um, so now we're on the cell phone, but uh, Rich, thanks so much for, for taking the time to, to chat. It was cool kind yeah. of hearing your story and learning you know, what, what led to Savage Gear. Um, how, how can people get in touch with you if they, they want to buy your stuff? Yeah, so the uh, best thing to do is come to the store uh, 24 Reporter Court, that's in the North Conway Village, which is kind of a great place to be. Uh, we're open Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 5. Find us on the web, savagemountaingear.com. Find us uh, geardocnh.com, forecastequipment.com for the tools, and then mountain-equipment.com for uh, the mount equipment stuff. Cool. You on Instagram? We are, yep, Savage Mountain Gear on Instagram. Sweet. So awesome. we get that out every couple of days. Try not to flood people with it. So yeah. That's, <laughs> we try to get out there every couple of days. I it. think it's some, some good content. I, I always like seeing it. It is. It's so. fun. We try to make them fun and light, not too serious. Yeah. Sweet. Awesome, man. Well, um, thanks for tuning in to Do Who Does Things. This is the one of the inaugural fireside chat conversations <laughs> with a, a local legend here in New Hampshire. So. Uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Great. Thanks, man. Absolutely. Thank you.